Old Testament lesson this morning. Our first reading comes from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 55, beginning at verse 1 through verse 13. An invitation to abundant life. Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear and your soul shall live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, the sure mercies of David. Indeed, I have given him as a witness to the people a leader and a commander for the people. Surely you shall call a nation you do not know, and nations who you do not know shall run to you because of the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down from heaven, and the snow from above, and do not return there, but water the earth, and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out with joy and be led out with peace. The mountains and the hills, they shall break forth into singing before you, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come upon the cypress tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Our epistle lesson this morning is Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians, chapter 4, beginning at verse 11 through verse 19. To the present hour we both hunger and thirst, and we are poorly clothed and beaten and homeless. And we labor working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, and being persecuted, we endure. Being defamed, we entreat. We have been made as the filth of the world, the offscouring of all things until now. Now I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you, for though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Therefore I urge you, imitate me. For this reason I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. Now some are puffed up as though I were not coming to you. But I will come to you shortly, and if the Lord wills, and I will know, not the word of those who are puffed up, but the power. And our gospel lesson this morning is, comes from the first gospel, the gospel of Matthew, chapter 12, beginning at verses 33 through verse 46. A tree known by its fruit. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. Brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it on the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Then some of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, 
Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But Jesus answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the hearts of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed a greater Jonah is there. The queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed a greater than Solomon is here. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places, seeking rest and finding none. And then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. And then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it also be with this wicked generation. And while he was still talking to the multitude, behold, his mother and his brother stood outside, seeking to speak with him. Here ends the reading. Let us pray this morning before the preaching of the word. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we come to you today with open hearts. We pray, Lord God, that our eyes would be opened and that our minds would be attentive to what you have to say to us today. We pray, Lord God, that we would be convicted in our sin, but more importantly, Lord, that we would be refreshed in the good news of the gospel. And so we pray, Lord God, that we would take all these things to heart as we meditate upon what you would have to say to us today through the examples of the believers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On the calendar of the church, the 28th of March is dedicated to the witness of Hans Nielsen Hauge. Helge was Norway's greatest man who ever lived. And he experienced a profound religious conviction on April 5, 1796. He had just recently turned 25 years old. And on this day, this young man was plowing in his field, and he was humming the same hymn that we sang this morning as our opening song. He was humming, Jesus, I long for thy blessed communion. And as he was singing this hymn to himself, the lyrics spoke to him in a profound way. And it especially hit him when he got to the part that says, Show me more clearly my hopeless condition. Show me the depths of corruption in me, so that my nature may die in contrition, and that my spirit may live with thee. Now while singing these lyrics, two thoughts came to Haugi's mind. And the first thought that pressed upon him was the great sorrow that he felt for his sin. He was particularly struck with how he had not loved God with all of his heart. And instead, he had found pleasures in the charms of this world. And at the same time, as he pondered how his sins had pulled him away from Christ, this same man also felt an overwhelming sense of relief that Christ had made full satisfaction for his sins. Now, to be clear, Haugi did not see blinding lights, he did not hear a booming voice, nor did he develop scales on his eyes that eventually dropped from his face. It was not like Saul on the way to Damascus. But on that 5th of April, 1796, he was changed just as much as Saul became the Apostle Paul. Haugi later wrote about this experience. He wrote, Now my heart was lifted up. It was lifted up to God in such a way I simply cannot explain it. There was glory in my soul. My tongue no longer could describe it. Something supernatural, divine, and blessed. I felt the most fervent love of God and for my neighbor. My heart was completely changed. And after Haugi returned from the fields at the end of that day's work, he could not cease and desist from talking about his Lord. His immediate family was moved by his testimony. His sister Anna committed herself to God that very same day. And quite a few of his family members also arrived at a new closeness to the Lord. And it's said that for about three weeks straight, that besides doing the necessary farm work, 
that the only thing he wanted to do was read his Bible and just soak in God's grace and mercy and talk about it at all moments. Well, finally, after about three weeks, he was able to get back to a more normal routine, and as he crossed paths with anyone, what did he inquire of that person? But how is your relationship with the Lord? And many people were moved by his witness. But as time progressed, of course, that some people tired of him speaking about this. Yes, a few people were edified and loved to talk about the Lord with him, but many more people thought, Hans, can you not speak about anything else? And so he figured that he needed to take his energy and his excitement, he needed to travel around with it and bring it to other people so that he wouldn't just saturate the same people with the good news that he had to share. So in short time, Haugi wrote some pamphlets and he decided to have them printed. And so as he walked to a printing press, the nearest one, which, you know, there weren't so many of those in those days, and as he walked to the nearest printing press, he had this conviction that came under him. He thought, what am I doing? Here I am, the simple man, this man of the fields, you know, a man who had only had a fourth grade education. Here he was going to have something printed and distribute. And he almost turned around in doubt and, and skepticism and, and went back home. But at the same time, he could not shake the compulsion either that God had called him to something special and that people would understand him and he could communicate with the gospel in a way that no other pastor could do. Now, can you relate? Can you relate to Haugi's apprehension about sharing about your faith? Yeah, you likely have not experienced a season where you stop doing everything that you normally do and read the Bible for three weeks straight. Your speech is probably not consisted exclusively of words about the Lord, that you only could converse about your Christian faith. And while you have likely not been so radically moved in a powerful way like Hans Nielsen Hauge was, have you ever tired of bringing up Christ to people who just don't seem to want to listen? Maybe you've wanted to address some problem or sin that you have observed in yourself or in your children or your friends, and you just don't know how to speak about it. Perhaps your spouse refuses to come to church with you anymore. Perhaps you've critiqued your son or daughter for walking away from the Lord, and now he or she is upset with you. Do they not call you anymore? Does your child ignore you because he or she knows that the way that he or she is living his life is not pleasing and honoring you, and it disappoints you? It can be difficult to know how forward to be when speaking about true spiritual matters. Haugi himself didn't feel qualified for the task. And many times you can feel intimidated to share your Christian faith with others. What if people don't want to hear about your experience? What if your friends or your coworkers or neighbors think you're going to be weird? It can often feel intimidating to speak about the Lord with those around you. And sometimes you feel self-conscious and you worry that you're not going to be able to string together the words correctly. Or you're nervous that people will be more confused by what you say than they were before they heard your words. And they might be even turned off from attempting to follow God all the more. Still, in other moments, you might not be so worried about what you're going to say for yourself, but you worry, you're concerned, oh, what if that person starts asking me questions about the Bible or God? And I don't know exactly how to answer all those things. Remember, Remember that of a man like Hans Nielsen Hauge, who had a fourth grade education, if he could become Norway's greatest man and evangelize the country and, and preach to a way that many people came to salvation, certainly you can write a Bible verse in a card that you mail. If a fellow with no training could become Norway's greatest evangelist, you certainly can say one thing to God, one sentence about how the Lord has worked in your life. While you have succumbed likely to nervousness in the past about sharing your faith, with God's help, you can overcome your fears of doing such a thing, just as Haugi did too. In fact, not only did his feelings of inadequacy dissipate, but he felt compelled to travel the entire country and talk to people one-on-one -on -one and in, in large crowds both about who God is. He walked across all the country, and that is not an easy nation to walk across. It's not flat like western Minnesota. Many fjords, many mountains, many valleys. Not only did he walk and bring the gospel to places, he was so productive in what he did that as he traveled from place to place, sometimes on foot, sometimes on snowshoe in the wintertime, that he would knit as he was walking. Because he thought, when I get to my new place that I'm going to visit, 
Somebody who's cold, I'll give them a hat. Somebody who's cold, I'll give them a pair of gloves. So when he finally arrived at whatever location he traveled to, all across the country, far north and far south, people were intrigued by his personality. Who is this man that walks around everywhere? And people were just drawn like a magnet to what he had to say because his method was simple. Sometimes he'd approach a farmer and ask, oh, may I help you with your field work today? You know, and what farmer without the tractors and machinery that one has today wouldn't say yes to that? And he'd, he'd help this farmer and talk to him, and finally the farmer would feel so grateful for the assistance that he had received that the farmer would say, why don't you come on in for dinner? And then they'd start talking, and what a good conversation they'd have because he was a very social person, and people just loved to be around him. Even people who weren't believers loved to talk to him. And so finally, after a couple days of him helping out with the uh, field work, uh, some people would hear about it, and they'd come and visit him. And then finally, okay, we got enough people now. Let's have a meeting one night. Let's just gather together in somebody's house, and we'll study the Bible, and we'll talk about the Lord. And then it would continue on and continue on until it got to be too many people in a house. So, oh, let's go out in an open field. And it would just continue like that, and finally it would come to the point where you know, he, would tra- he would come to church and go to service with people in the morning, and then afterwards he would stand outside and encourage the people all the more to go forth with the gospel and be serious about their Christian faith. And you'd think that the pastors would have loved this, to have somebody so encouraged in, and in strengthening the people in their faith. But the pastors didn't like it, because pastors are human beings too, and many times with greater faults. And they became jealous of the attraction that he had with these people, because he was one of them. He knew how to speak to them. He knew how to walk the walk that they walked. He wasn't these pastors who had gone to Denmark and had this university education and had come back and were the supposedly you know, smartest people in the community. And so they became jealous. And even one time there was a fellow who was so annoyed by one of Hauge's friends that as this guy gave a testimony after church as he was talking to people as they went back to their buggies and horses and that he convinced some of the other people in the congregation to bind this guy up and drag him along his trailer. And he whipped the horses, and they raced as fast as they could back to the parsonage. And this fellow, forevermore, was bruised in his body, and his health was damaged because of this. Can you imagine such a sight? Many people's souls were turned in this revival. And yet the pastors felt threatened more often than not. And because the situation in that time, the relationship of the church and the state in Norway was a state church relationship. And so the pastors and the law enforcement were in close conversation and contact with one another. And sometimes the pastors would call the authorities and they would arrest the people who were doing this. And it was illegal because in that time the church was so powerful that if you were having a meeting without the pastors there to supervise, that that meeting was illegal. Not only in terms of the congregation that you'd be in trouble, but it was also against the laws of the state. And so the police were in on this as well. Now, sometimes the police didn't really care about this, and they had real criminals to look after, and so they would just force Haugi to you know, walk out of their jurisdiction. He'd be in the next region and do the same thing. But other times, they threw him in prison. And one time, he was jailed for a significant time, just like his friends were. And this intensified over the years. As his fame spread, the jealousy grew deeper. Then another time, a Haugi and another one of his friends, his name was Hamster, they were thrown in jail. And this time, their incarceration was over the Christmas season, like I told you. And on the evening of the 24th, some of Haugi's friends came out to visit him outside his prison. They couldn't go inside. But uh, they caroled because it was Christmas Eve. And he couldn't shout out to them because he knew that he'd get in trouble if he did that. But he just simply lifted up his lantern in the window and showed them that he still was celebrating the birth of Christ and that he still had the joy of the babe of Bethlehem in his heart. And so he wrote those words that we sang in our second song this morning. With God in grace I'm dwelling. What harm can come to me? Though Satan is compelling his powers to ruin me, though they in chains may bind me inside this prison cell, yet Christmas here can find me. Within my heart tis well. Well, Hauge was eventually released from prison. And they could only really keep him for a short amount of time for most of the time because he wasn't really guilty of anything, except for they would sometimes charge him with vagrancy, of being, you know, spending too much time outside his home and being, really being homeless is what they accused him of being. And this cycle continued for a number of years. And finally they figured out a trick 
that they could not keep him in prison for any crime. So instead what they did was they would prevent him from ever standing trial in the first place by continuing to seek out witnesses and just making it a bureaucratic circle that one time they were able to keep him inside his cell for 10 years straight. While Hauge was usually in good spirits, this imprisonment was detrimental to his physical health. And as you remember from what I talked about earlier this morning, that he was a robust man walking thousands of miles, being stuck in the stocks for 10 years, being bound in chains, his body not having proper exercise, his health quickly deteriorated. And when he was finally released from incarceration after that decade, he was no longer able to travel any significant distance, and he was forced to live in a house that his friends bought for him in early retirement. His friends found him a place out in the countryside, and there people came to him instead and sought his advice, and he would share devotions and, and preach the people from his chair. And it was only at 52 years of age, almost 200 years ago now, that Hauge left this world on the 28th of March, 1824. By means of the state and the church, Hauge was robbed of his health. The church robbed itself of the best evangelist that nation has ever had. The church did it. Those 10 years of sitting in shackles broke his body. Yes, they were able to prevent him from preaching and teaching beyond his prison cell, but they couldn't stop him from within his prison cell, and many inmates were one for God as well. They could not deprive him of the joys of salvation. They were able to imprison his body, but they could not confine him away from the joy and presence of the Lord. As St. Paul wrote to the Romans in the 8th chapter, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ Jesus our Lord? The Roman authorities deprived Paul of his earthly years, and his witness was snuffed out at a young age by putting him to death. But both Paul and Hans Nielsen Hauge still kept the faith, even though they found themselves on the wrong side. Of the law. Perhaps a couple of you have served days or weeks or months or years behind bars. Maybe somebody close to you has been or is incarcerated. Maybe the situation was simply a great misunderstanding. Maybe it was a miscarriage of justice. However, some of you might have spent time in prison for wrongs that you did commit. But at the least, if you spent time locked up, that it likely did not ruin your physical health nor the health of your loved one who is behind bars. But suffice it to say that all of you here this morning and those of you listening on the broadcast are not the person physically that you used to be. Perhaps the poor decisions of your life, the poor health that has come from those decisions of a loved one, or the drama thereof has zapped you of your zest and energy. But maybe you cannot walk too many miles anymore. Never mind that you could have at one time walked a thousand miles in your life. The world dispenses its troubles in greater number as the years go on. Perhaps the curse of this world with its increasing toll has deprived you of your body's use to use your hands and your feet and your wrists or to lift anything anymore that you don't have any strength. Maybe you cannot walk more than a couple steps Maybe you cannot walk at all. Maybe you cannot read any longer. Your eyesight is too poor. Maybe your memory is gone, and you can't remember what you had for breakfast. Speaking about these things, talking about losing things, being robbed of things, as I walked into church this Tuesday morning, I noticed that the safe was not in its normal spot. And in my cognitive delay, I momentarily wondered, I wonder what malfunctioned with the safe that it had to be taken in to be fixed. And after I grabbed my Bible and got ready to go downstairs for Bible study and then walked through this room back here again, I saw that the door was ajar. And then it hit me. The church had been burglarized. The safe was gone. And so I walked quickly downstairs. And as I shared this initial news with the others, we were just getting ready to start Bible study. And so a couple of the men raced upstairs and looked and investigated around to see if there were any footprints or anything like that. And Dave couldn't read his phone. He didn't have his glasses with him. He just got up so quickly that I had to take out my cell phone and dialed the police. 
And when I called the sheriff, they came out to look at everything, and they started uh, their investigation. And it dawned on me later as I was thinking about this, well, unlike Haugi, at least this time, we're on the right side of the law, and those criminals are on the wrong side of the law. So anyway, so we got back downstairs, and we convened, and we were talking about this and trying to think about what was in that safe. And it uh, occurred to us that, oh, the worst thing about that safe being gone even in spite of the money being gone and the work that the women had done in gathering up cheer baskets, we lost all those records. 130 years of church records, of baptisms, confirmations, weddings, ordinations, funerals, and burials. Now all of it gone, just like this. And anything but the most outstanding pieces of information that had not been recorded in an anniversary booklet we're now lost. And anybody from now on who contacted our church looking to do genealogical work could not receive any help from the place that's supposed to have such information. As I thought to myself and, and others as well, I'm sure, that there's, we thought, what a loss, because there's nobody around today who can tell us about what happened in this church in the year 1890. And so I pictured what was happening to these records, thinking about thieves lighting up a blowtorch and trying to you know, get inside the safe and then burning up everything that was inside the safe or taking a sledgehammer, smashing the lock and trying to find the money and not finding that much money and then just throwing the paperwork all over the ground and there was still on snow at the beginning of this week and thinking about how all those irreplaceable documents were being water damaged and that there was just no hope of ever seeing those records again. <laughs> so I went home, resigned to this sad thought, and I sent out emails to all the other pastors in the community, and I wrote to them, I said, you know, watch your church buildings. Our building was broken into. The safe was taken. And Pastor Kevin Moline of the New London Evangelical Covenant Church said, 25 years ago, this happened to us too. And the safe was taken. It was discovered some weeks or months later, floating in Lake Monongalia, north of New London. The paperwork's still in it, but totally soaked. And that just confirmed every fear that I had about what was going to happen. And so as I was thinking about those records and what was no longer there for us to look at, and I remembered, as some of you maybe know anyway, that our church for the first 40 years of its existence belonged to a church body called the Hauge Synod, named after Hans Nielsen Hauge. And when the Hauge Synod merged with other church bodies in 1917, this church body wanted to continue in the Haugian tradition and not compromise on the importance of each person having spiritual gifts to offer to the church. And it wasn't just a bureaucratic kind of thing. And so the, uh, this congregation here voted to be an independent congregation instead of joining that merger. And the congregation continued carrying this uh, emphasis until 1936. And then this church voted to affiliate with the Lutheran Free Church and carry on in that same tradition of honoring the lay people is being just as important a part of the ministry as any pastor or bishop. And so it continues to this day in the Association of Free Lutheran Congregations, our seminary chapel. What is the name of its chapel but the Hans Nielsen Hauge Chapel? This heritage still continues with us, even if there were no records. We think of Jean Berg's great uncle, who was a traveling evangelist for the Hauge and Lutheran Intermission Federation. So we thank and praise God this day for such a great heritage that we have in this congregation. First of all, we give loud praise and thanks to God that this congregation safe was discovered four miles south of the border of this county by a farmer, as Dave told you, three quarters of a mile off Highway 71. The record books were still inside, safe and intact, and not damaged. Praise God. I would hardly give in a prayer that the results could have been so positive. I never imagined that this would turn out so well. The only thing lost... Sadly, the money from the Women's Missionary Society. It's a reminder to us all of what's really important in life, serving God, but that money is not the end of our life. It is not the goal, the directive, the objective of our life. The money can go, God's word, God's heritage, that's what gives our lives meaning, not how much money is in the bank. Even if those records would have been lost forever, they cannot rob us of our witness and our testimony. They cannot take away the witness that many souls are in eternity today because of the ministry of the forefathers in this congregation. The authorities of Hauge's day 
They could chain his body. They could take away his right to meet with believers. They could intimidate folks, but they could not deprive him. They could not rob him of his Redeemer. As Psalm 16 told him, and as Psalm 16 tells us, the Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You, Lord, have made my lot secure. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely my inheritance is delightful. The world cannot take away history. The world cannot take away God's work in you. While thieves can steal the offerings of the saints and the papers that record their history, they cannot take away their love for God and they cannot take away your love for God. They can take away your right to meet and assemble as God's people. They can prevent you from speaking about God's name in public, but they cannot take away the joy that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There is no court, there is no legislature that can legislate, that can make a rule, that can decree anything against you having Christ in your heart. The devil and his workers cannot steal your salvation from you. As John chapter 10, verse 19 says, The devil comes to rob, to steal, and destroy. But Jesus said about his beloved sheep in verse 28, No one, no one can snatch them out of my Father's hands. The world will continue to rob you of many things. If depression or cancer or dementia or Parkinson's disease will deprive you of function and life, the author of life will not abandon you even when your body is no good anymore. Even when your body has deteriorated to ashes, he will not abandon you to the grave, the scriptures tell you. While this world may offer its charms for the moment, do not imprison yourself in the confines of hell for eternity. While you may be tempted to think that your sins are not that big a deal compared to a real thief or a real murderer, as scripture tells us that when you have hated your brother, you have committed murder in your heart. When you have taken something when you're from your brother or sister and they did not authorize such a thing, you have stolen from your loved one. Why sentence yourself to an eternity without God when he promises you a banquet of everlasting fellowship with those who rejoice in that blessed invitation? Why commit yourself to prison to be cast away far from God in eternity? Never mind doing such a thing upon earth. But why would you sentence yourself to eternity when you can be with God and enjoy his riches and enjoy his blessings and enjoy the company of all those who love God? Do not rob yourself of salvation. Do not let yourself be sucked into the moment, to be taken away, to be distracted by the charms of this world, however short it is. When things can be gone from you in an instant, just like those records almost left us, 130 years worth, do not commit yourself to 130 to nor 260 and keep doing the multiplication in your head. Do not rob yourself of eternity with God. Belong to him. Rejoice in him claiming you. Do not be distracted by the cares of this world. Do not be discouraged, just as Hauge was likely discouraged. One time as he was, you know, as he was walking to have those things published, his pamphlets, and he thought, oh, Lord, what am I doing? How can I witness to you? I'm just a simple man. Many times you folks just think the same thing. You think, what can I do? I'm just one person. How can I witness? But remember that if one man like Hauge could change the world to be Norway's greatest man, that think of the effort, think of the effect that you can have in your life by simply witnessing to one person about how much greater it is to be, to be a Christian, to have the treasure of Jesus Christ in your heart, worth more than all the money in the world, worth more than all the momentary pleasures of life. Do not let the devil rob you of what is yours in Christ Jesus through faith. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we come to you once again in giving thanks for the beautiful witness of Hans Nielsen Hauge and Lord we thank you that you raised up such a leader in that time two centuries ago to, to preach the gospel to bring good news to souls who who didn't have much to hear about on Sunday morning Lord whose pastors had little to share them share anything with them Lord except for some opinions and some reflections but Lord that they did not have that power that your word gives to those who call upon you. And so, Lord, we thank you that the word has been preached with 
truth and power in Norway until these recent times where it's backsliding again. And, and Lord, we think of our own country as well and how much we have lost in these last decades and years. And Lord, we pray that revival would come to our congregation and our community and our church body and to our nation again, Lord, that people would turn to you in desperation, wanting to hear a word of grace and forgiveness and mercy and not simply some entertaining story to make us feel good for the moment. Lord God, we pray for ourselves and our spiritual condition, each one of us, Lord, that we pray that we would be right in our relationship with you, that we would not be casual in our Christian walk, but Lord, that we would take it seriously, that we would have an answer to how these questions when we came to others and said, how is it with you and the Lord? We pray, Lord God, that each one of us would have that answer settled in our hearts this morning. And Lord God, we pray that we would also be people who would speak those words of comfort, that we would address the needs of those who are hurting, Lord, that we would be uh, industrious, Lord, as Hauge even was too, and not even having time to cover all that, Lord, in the sermon this morning. What, what a great uh, humanitarian he was as well, Lord. We thank you that you have given this church gifts to bless the world with in charity. And Lord, we pray that we will be good neighbors and not withhold the gospel from all those who would be looking for something in this world. So we pray, Lord God, that you would use us and commission us to preach the word with power and with boldness, just as you inspired that man 2,000 years ago. Lord God, we pray that you would stir each one of our hearts to find salvation in our souls through the simple preaching of law and gospel, just like your servant, Hans Nielsen Hauge. We give thanks to him. We give you thanks, Lord, for bringing our church to the struggle this week. We pray for each person in our congregation who's hurting this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.